Hello, and a warm note of welcome to all of you here with us, sharing our common pursuits of knowledge, faith, and learning from Fairfield University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you, our virtual community, as the Regina A. Quick Center for the Arts celebrates its 30th anniversary by expanding beyond the walls of our theater to serve our campus, our neighbors, and viewers from around the globe. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic and in keeping with our almost 500-year Jesuit heritage, Fairfield University embraces this opportunity to pivot to live online experiences and to meet the world as it is. As the modern Jesuit Catholic University, we are dedicated to being a civic institution, a destination for arts and culture. We are committed to the life of the mind and thus value human creativity, open discourse, and reasoned and respectful debate. We invite you to be a part of the Fairfield University experience and enjoy over 50 unique and engaging sessions that highlight our expert faculty, talented students, community partners, leading public thinkers, and exceptional artists. Thank you, President Nemec. Welcome to 30 years of celebrating the performing arts at the Quick Center for the Arts at Fairfield University. It is our great pleasure this fall to bring you over 60 virtual programs in the performing and visual arts. To our members and supporters, thank you for your continued support. It means the world to us in these challenging times. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the founder and moderator of our Open Visions Forum, Dr. Philip Eliasov. Philip, over to you. Philip Eliasov, and a warm welcome to you on this beautiful autumn evening. We're here at Fairfield University's Quick Center for the Arts for tonight's special Open Visions Forum Espresso program featuring Professor Harriet F. Senny. We really appreciate having with us tonight and knowing that in the next hour, we're going to uh, allow you to think about some issues about art and the quest for our national identity. Let me quickly tell you the game plan for what will happen. Uh, first, uh, Carrie Weber, our executive director of our Fairfield University Art Museum. Uh, she will give an introduction uh, for Professor Fenny, uh, Senny. And uh, then we will uh, listen to her, Professor Senny's slide presentation. Um, this will be, I assure you, this will be very engaging. I had a sneak preview of it and I think that you're going to be quite uh, engaged by what you're going to see and hear. After her slide talk, we will then uh, recess into a um, animated conversation. We'll be joined by artist Howard Skrill and Carrie and myself, along with Professor Senny. Then we will encourage you to send your questions on the chat room, which you see at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to write any short and relevant question and we hope to get to all of the questions. So without any further ado, let me introduce Carrie Weber, the Executive Director of Fairfield University's Art Museum. Carrie, please. Thank you, Philip. Uh, before I get started, I just want to remind our first year students who are joining us this evening to snap a picture of the chat and send that with your student ID number to uh, the museum email, museum at fairfield.edu, in order to get credit for um, joining us this evening. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm, I'm here with you tonight because about two years ago, artist Howard Skrill and I began a conversation about having a museum exhibition of his artwork depicting public monuments. Late this past spring, while still in the midst of the pandemic lockdown, when we were unable to install the works in the museum as planned, we created the museum's first virtual exhibition entitled Howard Skrill Monumental Follies. After tonight's program, I encourage you to visit the museum's website and view this exhibition. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, as we look to create programming to complement the exhibition, I was introduced to art historian, Dr. Harriet Senny by my Fairfield colleague, professor of art history and visual culture, Dr. Catherine Schwab. 
Senny's extensive scholarly work on monuments meshes beautifully with the subjects of Howard Skrill's current artistic practice. I'm grateful to Philip Eliasoff and the Quick Center for organizing tonight's talk and for helping us to bring uh, Dr. Senny to Fairfield University. Amidst the events of the past few months and the continuing challenges being made to Confederate monuments and other controversial memorials in the wake of ongoing protests over sy systemic racism and police violence, this evening's program is so timely and more important than ever. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Senny this evening. Dr. Harriet F. Senny is the director of the MA program in art history and art museum studies at City College CUNY and teaches at the CUNY Graduate Center. She's the author of six books and numerous articles on public art and is co-founder of the international organization Public Art Dialogue and co-editor of its journal. Senny was a member of the Mayor's Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments and Markers and the She Build New York Advisory Committee. She was recently appointed to the Task Force on Monuments, Statues, Public Art, and Historical Markers by the New York City Council. Tonight, you will get a preview of Dr. Senny's newest book, which is coming out soon, Monumental Controversies, Route R Mount Rushmore, Four Presidents, and the Quest for National Identity, and from which this evening's talk got its title. It is my great pleasure to join the Quick Center for the Arts in welcoming Dr. Senny to the virtual stage at Fairfield University. Welcome, Harriet. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, just a word, this is a work, this book is a work in progress. So what you're gonna be hearing tonight are the kinds of things that really got my attention because they surprised me. And I'd be really interested at the end when we get to the questions, if you would share some of the things that surprised you. But first, a few words about how I came to write this book. Because today, as Carrie just said, it sounds as if I grabbed it from the headlines, but no. Actually, it was prompted by my experience of serving on the New York City, I have to read this title every time, Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments and Markers, which is a mouthful. This was formed in the wake of the Charlottesville riots in 2017, and the subsequent drive to remove Confederate memorials. The commission met three times during the fall of 2017 to decide the fate of four controversial monuments in New York, none of which were Confederate. The plaque to Marshall Patan, which is on Lower Broadway, you kind of see that in the lower right hand with a little bit of a map of where it's located in the so-called Canyon of Heroes. Dr. Marion Sims, opposite the New York Academy of Medicine in Upper Manhattan, the very controversial equestrian statue of Theodore Roosevelt in front of the American Museum of Natural History, but probably not for much longer, and the Christopher Columbus in Columbus Circle. And if anybody has any questions about these, I'll be happy to answer them later. But my point being that my most concerning takeaway from this experience was the dominant and often toxic kind of either or thinking. In other words, either Theodore Roosevelt was a good guy, bad guy. Well, he was both and he was a product of his time. So in a very real sense, at least in my mind, the subtitle of this book should be how to get from or to and. How to develop an inclusive narrative, the kind of narrative that is in direct opposition to a singular story of American history articulated most recently by the current president and one that Mount Rushmore still seems to represent to many. The quest for national identity or whose nation is it has been challenged recently by Black Lives Matter and other movements that are current. These have focused on past monuments and the monolithic but incomplete narratives that they convey. And this includes Mount Rushmore and the four presidents represented there. So what I'm going to be doing this evening is focusing on that quote unquote other excluded history. But I wanna be very clear before I begin that this is not an attempt to disavow the accomplishments of these men. Rather, 
It is to start a conversation about what a more inclusive narrative might be, how we might address the inherent complexities and contradictions of our national identity, or at least acknowledge that it's not singular. So let's just take a look at where these complexities begin. They start with Mount Rushmore itself. The original impulse to build Mount Rushmore came from the South Dakota state historian, Joan Robinson. His motive was to increase tourism to the Black Hills, which is where the Mount Rushmore is located. And this is truly a beware of what you wish for kind of thing, because if you could see the degree to which the tourism has been increased, you would totally know what I mean. And among his other aims was to depict local heroes, including Native American chiefs. Another contradiction. At the time of Mount Rushmore's construction, which spans from 1927 to 1941, the Black Hills were not legally owned by the United States. They were clearly ceded to the Lakota Sioux in the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. And just a reminder that treaties can only be made between independent nations. Finally, in 1980, the Supreme Court ruled that the United States seizure of the Black Hills was illegal. They awarded the Sioux some $17,500,000 that the Sioux refused. Why did they refuse it? Because the Black Hills were never for sale. Today, that amount would be in the billions. In 2012, more recently, the United Nations recommended the return of the Black Hills to the Lakota Sioux. That has not happened. There are many distinctions between Native American and Western beliefs, but most relevant here is the view of the land. Native Americans consider it communal. It's viewed like a mother who nourishes them. So clearly they wouldn't sell it. We, on the other hand, consider it private property, something to own. It's the bedrock of our economic system. In fact, the more you own, the better. It was this quest, or I should say our quest, the United States quest for territorial expansion that was behind this country's horrific treatment of Native Americans, which involved displacing them. And expansion, as it turned out, was the key theme of Mount Rushmore, at least in the mind of its sculptor. Gutsum Borglund, whom you see here, was a racist and an anti-Semite. And he wasn't even Don Robinson's first choice. That was another sculptor, Laredo Taft, who wasn't well enough to take the commission. Then he turned to Borglum, who at the time was working on Stone Mountain in Atlanta, a Confederate monument. Borglum expanded the original vision of Robert E. Lee to include Jefferson Davis, who was president of the Confederacy and one of its heroes, and also Stonewall Jackson, followed by cavalry and a lot of other things. Actually, Stone Mountain was closer to Borglum's own racist beliefs than Mount Rushmore. He told a reporter, quote, I'm celebrating an idea, the idea of strength, courage, self-sacrifice, and love. These men who fought for a lost cause went forth fearlessly to do their best as they saw it, end quote. Borglum was known to be a white supremacist. He was closely associated with the Ku Klux Klan, although there's no documentary evidence that he ever joined it. This commission also revealed his difficult personality. He got into an argument with the patrons over money. Borglum typically overspent, he was known for it. When they fired him, he smashed his models and was chased out of town by the local sheriff. I'm surprised they haven't made a movie, actually. He went straight to Mount Rushmore. At Mount Rushmore, Borglum expanded the vision just as he had at Stone Mountain. But what he was celebrating was the, quote, foundation, preservation, and continental expansion of the United States, 
nothing about essential democratic values. Expansion is the key word. And what about the four presidents represented here? This is Borglund's initial sketch, and you can see that he first thought of Washington and Lincoln. Well, I'm going to start going to start with George Washington because that's what Borglum did, as you can see, and also because Washington was responsible for establishing so much of what we now consider our national identity. And by the time Borglum got to Mount Rushmore, he had plenty of sculptural precedents that might serve as models. But let's think a minute about those initial sculptures. Those artists face quite a challenge. What should a president look like? And what should he wear? There were no models for presidents. He wasn't a king, but what exactly was he? And very closely associated with that, what should he wear? How should he present? And underneath those questions is really an underlying quest to define a unique American style, something appropriate for a unique new country with no art schools and no art museums. I wanna say that when I first started looking at these early representations of Washington in sculpture, I expect that the earlier ones to be dressed in a neoclassical style, picking up European custom based on Greek and Roman art. That's not what happened. This is the first monumental statue that became the basis of many more images that followed. This is Jean-Antoine Houdon's Washington, finished in 1791 and installed in 1796. Houdon was one of the most preeminent sculptors of his day. He was chosen on the advice of Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. When he created this statue and he came to this country to do it, he wanted to work from George Washington himself. Washington was 53. He had just resigned his military commission, so he's not yet president. And he was returning to his life as a gentleman farmer after eight and a half years of war. So Udon comes over, spends several days with Washington at Mount Vernon. He made a life mask, which you see here, which he gave to Washington. He modeled a bust in terracotta, later that was fired and painted white, and it's now at Mount Vernon. And he took Washington's bodily measurements. So there's some discussion then about whether to make the statue larger than life. And they decided against it because Washington was a pretty tall guy. He was six feet, two inches, and that was exceptionally tall for the day. More critical discussion centered on his appropriate attire. And here's where I first began to have my questions. Jefferson approved the original plan to represent Washington in, quote, classical robes of a Roman senator, end quote. But Washington didn't approve. He said, a servile adherence to the garb of antiquity might not be altogether so expedient as some little deviation in favor of the modern costume. So Washington knew of Benjamin West's success with his painting, The Death of the General Wolf, which you see on the screen here, work of 1770, which became very popular. Clearly, Washington and Jefferson had different interpretations of appropriate American style. Jefferson was known for his preference for the neoclassical. It derived from European culture, which is why I thought that's where they would begin, and referred back, as I said, to Greek and Roman art. But Washington was less schooled and less cultured than Jefferson, but his instincts were much closer to what the American public liked. Once Washington was dead, Jefferson was able to pursue his preference for the neoclassical. And you see this here in Antonio Canova's Washington. This was made for the North Carolina State Capitol in Raleigh. And it was installed in 1818. Jefferson again recommended the artist. And in a letter to the North Carolina, North Carolina Senator at the time, Nathaniel Macon, Jefferson wrote, as to the style or costume, I'm sure the artist and every person of taste in Europe would be for the Roman, 
the effect of which is undoubtedly of a different order. Our boots and regimentals have a very puny effect. So you can see that Jefferson has changed his tune. So what we're seeing here is Washington dressed as a Roman general, wearing a knee length toga and sandals, writing his farewell address. As you can also see, the work was destroyed very shortly after it was installed, but by 1831, it was already one of the most admired works of art in the country, even though the initial reception was a little hesitant. Um, in 1970, a marble copy was installed in the North Carolina Capitol Rotunda. A plaster cast survived in the North Carolina Museum of History, and that was the focus of an art exhibition at the Frick Museum in New York in 2018 called Canover's George Washington, which has an excellent catalog. But the neoclassical tradition could get carried too far for American taste. This is Horatio Greenow's George Washington of 1832 to 41. This is a very large work. It's 11 feet, four inches. So almost twice as tall as Washington. Greenow, was the first native born American to make sculpture his exclusive vocation. But like all artists at that point would have trained in Europe and would be very familiar with the classical tradition and classical examples. So one inspiration for this work was the destroyed sculpture of Zeus by the Greek sculptor Phidias at Olympia. And you see a illustration of that on your right. This was known from published reconstructions. Greenout was right to be worried about public opinion. Issues of the president's near nudity made it look to people as if he were getting ready to take a bath. And I just wanna point out that this looks like way of seeing can be really problematic. Um, you can totally misinterpret the content of a work of art and we can come back to that. Of course, we also should keep in mind that the American public had next to no experience with classical fine art. Where would they have gotten that? So it, this was commissioned for the Capitol Rotunda, but the negative public opinion was so strong that it prompted a change of site. First, it was moved to the Capitol grounds, but this was not a statue that was meant to be outside. And the weather and the pigeons took their toll and, and people also felt that a bare chested figure looked a little strange when the weather turned cold. Years later, it was moved into the Romanesque Hall at the Smithsonian Institution in DC. And now it's located at the low ceiling entrance to the Hall of Museum of History and Technology also in DC. And it's interesting here, and we'll come back to this again, how the site changes or even determines our perception of a work of art. But sculpture doesn't totally convey historical content. Murals are more able to do that. But like sculpture, they can also be misinterpreted. What we're looking at here is a sample of a 13 mural installation at George Washington High School in San Francisco by the artist Victor Mikhail Arnatok. This was a WPA commission in 1936 intended to celebrate Washington. The artist Ornitoff was very familiar with Mexican muralists and so was interested in a kind of social critique. He depicted Washington as a champion of westward expansion, but to the detriment of Native Americans as, as you can clearly see by the figure lying on the ground and also depicted him as a slave owner. The students at the high school, however, didn't see the critical element. They felt somehow disparaged by it, even traumatized by it, and they petitioned to have the murals removed. This went on for quite some time and has yet to be decided. But as of October 5th, just a few days ago, the question of whether the murals must be covered over permanently is still in litigation. And the Alumni Association is launching an effort to change the name of the school. I don't know to what or if there'll be 
um, successful. I want to move a little bit now from the depiction of Washington to some of his policies, things that neither I nor my current students in a class on memorials today had learned about. So I'm curious maybe whether you have learned about them. On Native Americans, Washington would have preferred to acquire their land in a peaceable manner. But if that wasn't possible, he was prepared to take extreme measures. In fact, the Iroquois referred to him as town destroyer. He ordered a kind of scorched earth policy, destroyed crops, homes, killing people in their home, even setting them on fire, taking women and children as hostages to use as bargaining chips, all for the purpose of acquiring Native American land. And what about George Washington on slavery? The fact that he owned slaves is the reason that many today want his statues taken down. Just a reminder that most signers of the Declaration of Independence owned slaves. When Washington was 11, he inherited 10 slaves at the time of his father's death, and he continued to buy slaves just as he continued to buy land. He married well. He married the widow Martha Dandridge Custis and inherited 18,000 acres and nearly 300 slaves. But Martha's slaves were dower slaves. And what that meant was that they continued to belong to her family. So Washington had temporary ownership, but only through his lifetime. And it turns out Washington was a rather harsh taskmaster. Mary V. Thompson in her recent book, George Washington, Slavery and the Enslaved Community at Mount Vernon wrote this. Some of the worst things one thinks about in terms of slavery, whipping, keeping someone in shackles, tracking a person down with dogs, or selling people away from their family, all of those things happen either at Mount Vernon or on the plantations under Washington's management." End quote. Washington in public kept very quiet about slavery. He feared it would threaten the integrity of the Union, and indeed slavery is never mentioned in the Constitution. But Washington's position on slavery appeared to evolve. He started to make plans to free his slaves two years before his farewell address, but these plans were not realized. When he died in 1799, his will set his 124 slaves free when Martha died. Well, what do you think Martha did? She set them free at once because she feared for her life. That always seemed like a kind of um, strange requirement that he put in there. Martha set none of her 153 slaves free in her will. But what was also interesting about Washington's will was that he arranged for the young slaves to be educated. He arranged for them to learn to read, write, and learn some employable skills which was an indication that he didn't think they were inherently inferior, that they, but instead that they just lacked education and training. And he also allocated funds to care for the sick or old to manage on their own. So you see, this is a very complex issue. But the gap between the private and public positions of Washington made it possible for both the North and the South to claim him as their own during the Civil War, and I kind of think it's also evidence of his skill as a politician. It's also indicative of the prevailing view that Washington was inscrutable. So it is quite appropriate that his most famous memorial is abstract. The Washington Monument took decades to build, as you can see, and it's on the National Mall, and I imagine most people listening in have seen it or certainly have seen pictures of it. There were many different ideas of what an appropriate monument to the first president should be, but the final commission was awarded to the architect Clark Mills, and you see that design on the right. But it was radically simplified, the Washington Monument, and built by Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Casey of the Army Corps of Engineers. 
neither an artist nor an architect, but an engineer. And I just want to say, I don't have time to tell you how complicated the base of that monument that Mills designed would have been, it would take me another 15 minutes to tell you everything that's going on in there. So here we have this monument built by an engineer, no mention or depiction of Washington except in the monument's name. And it's been posited that it ends up more of a tribute to technology. It's got a very plain exterior, but an interior elevator that can take you to the top. And it sits there on the National Mall like a kind of abstract assertion of power. It's a 555 foot high obelisk. Obelisk, of course, is an Egyptian form used for memorials. And so it's interesting also to think that Thomas Jefferson's most famous memorial is also abstract. This is the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial, also known as the Gateway Arch located in St. Louis. And remember, Borglum's theme on Mount Rushmore was expansion. And expansion is the reason that he put Jefferson on Mount Rushmore, not the Declaration of Independence. So this arch was designed by the architect, Eero Saarinen in 1947. And of course, Jefferson's major contribution to the expansion of this country was the Louisiana Anna Purchase of 1803. And you can see that in the map on the right. It covered about 828,000 square miles and it doubled the size of the country. So the country as it existed before the Louisiana Purchase is to the right, where you see to the left of the Louisiana Purchase is not yet part of the United States. But this expansion occurred as always, I'm afraid, at the expense of the Native Americans who lived there. The arch itself opened in 1965, contemporary with the start of space exploration, which of course is a national expansion of a different nature. Memorials are always of the time when they were built, but as time goes on, they're seen in a different present. And I just wanna point out that an exclusively presentist lens often obscures the intended meaning of the memorial. Presentism has been defined as the presumption that the past can be judged by the standards of the present. And I would like to suggest that it certainly implies an inherent disrespect for history. A case in point is the equestrian statue in in front of the Museum of Natural History, at least for the time being, by James Earl Fraser. This was one of the works considered by the Mayoral Commission. I'll leave the name out this time. Um, and it was a work on which I did a fair amount of focused research, one, because the commission was given no information. And then the museum, when they decided to do an exhibition, hired me to do the background research on the statue itself. Fraser was a well-known and successful sculptor in his own day, although he's kind of fallen out of history. But if you've ever seen a buffalo nickel, you've seen his work. He was the chief assistant to Augustus St. Gaudens, probably the most famous name in American sculpture at the time. You may know Augustus St. Gaudens from the statue of General Sherman at the entrance to Central Park. Well, Fraser was the chief assistant on that project because St. Gaudens at that point was already quite ill. So what is this controversy about? It's about Roosevelt being on horseback and the standing figures of the Native American and the African American pictured beneath him. According to Fraser, the artist, the two figures at Roosevelt's side are guides symbolizing the continents of Africa and America. Those were the continents where Roosevelt hunted. And the reliefs on the parapet on the, on the surface of the building behind each of these figures represents the animals of the content, continents uh, that they stand for. The original commission was, for the statue was, I'm quoting, to symbolize the scientific, educational, outdoor and exploration aspects of Roosevelt's life 
rather than the political and the literary. And I just wanna interject here that I think an important question to ask about memorials before we take them down is whether the reason the memorial was built is the same as the reason we want to now take it down. So that would be true of Confederate memorials. They were built to celebrate the Confederacy and now we wanna take them down because that's no longer an ideology to which most of us ascribe. But in the case of Roosevelt, it becomes more complicated or in the case of Washington, it becomes more complicated because the reason we wanna take these memorials down is not the reason that they were put up. Anyway, it should prompt a more nuanced conversation. One of the things about Roosevelt was he did more for conservation than any other president before or since. He established 51 federal bird reserves, four national game preserves, five national parks on over 230 acres of public land. But again, the caveat this also involved seizing Native American land. So it seems we have come full circle. It starts and ends with whose land is it and how should it be used? If you have any doubt about whose land this is, oh, there's the relief, sorry, I skipped that one. You can see how they represent the animals of the respective continents. If you have any doubt about whose land this is, text your zip code to this number. I hope you will do this and you'll find out what tribe's land you are living on. Um, I know we live on Lenape land here, and I think you live on three different, the land belonging to three different tribes in Fairfield. And I'd like to suggest that a good step towards a more inclusive national narrative would be if each visitor on Mount Rushmore was asked to do this. But let's also keep in mind that the meaning of memorials is not fixed it's often determined by use. So the Lincoln Memorial built from 1912 to 21 by Daniel Chester French and Henry Bacon on the National Mall commemorates Lincoln as the savior of the union, not the great emancipator. Slavery even at this point was still a very problematic issue, something not to be mentioned as Washington believed and still continuing to be true at this point in time. But over time and use, the interpretation of the memorial changed. In 1939, Marian Anderson gave a concert there on Easter Sunday. This was after she'd been banned from the planned concert hall by the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution. At this point in time, the Capitol is still segregated. Anderson had to sleep in a private house. And all this, although this was kind of a symbolic triumph, it was really important nevertheless. 1963, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, Martin Luther King used Lincoln's memorial, quote, to legitimate political action. And he began his speech with a direct reference to Lincoln. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. The meaning of the memorial has changed. And Barack Obama used the memorial for commemorating his election as the first black president of the United States in 2009. Mount Rushmore has also been used by a number of presidents in different ways. In 1953, Eisenhower addressed the Young Republican League's convention. Basically, he used Mount Rushmore as backdrop. In 1991, George H.W. Bush dedicated the completion of the monument. This was at least the sixth dedication. This was a big event. It was produced by Radio City Music Hall. The actor Jimmy Stewart introduced him. At this uh, dedication, rededication, Bush called the Louisiana Purchase an opportunity for all Americans, and he deemed Van Rushmore a symbol of the American character, soaring and unafraid, no mention of broken treaties, etc. In 1996, President Clinton made no speech, mingled with visitors, 
and stayed for about an hour. And he spent twice as long at the Crazy Horse Memorial, which you see here, which is written up recently in the New Yorker, another story of Native American exploitation. Essentially, the sculptor Korzak Zolkowski made it a family business, a very profitable business. And he is buried at the foot of this unfinished monument. In 2002, President George W. Bush spoke mainly about political issues. And in 2014, President Obama, two years after the United Nations had recommended returning the Black Hills to the Sioux, refused, reviewed what his administration tried to do for Native Americans. He acknowledged their status as nations, as well as the many problems they still faced. Just this past July in 2020, President Trump made a pitch to have himself included on the mountain. He also committed to save monuments to the Confederacy. John Bodner, the historian in a recent article called Nostalgia and the Tragedy of Trump's Speech at Mount Rushmore said, quote, Americans emerge as a people beyond reproach, free of any hint of original sin or culpability for sordid deeds end quotes. He goes on to say, there was no mention of Indian removal, Jim Crow, lynching, race riots, labor exploitation, Vietnam, Iraq, sexual abuse, and environmental degradation. But these two are part of our national identity. And it's the goal of my book and hopefully future texts and memorials to construct a more inclusive narrative that more accurately presents our complex, many faceted history. And I'd like to leave you with a reminder that Mount Rushmore is always current. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet, for that really, that quite a tour through the nation's visible consciousness and, and, and unconscious <laughs> attempt at restructuring our national identity. Carrie, why don't we turn it over to you? Great, um, but to jump in on this uh, post-lecture conversation, I wanna welcome Howard Skrill. Um, Howard is an artist and art professor at St. Francis College, Brooklyn, New York, and Essex College in Newark, New Jersey. He has exhibited extensively throughout New England and his pictorial essays and other works have appeared in publications worldwide. In his drawings and paintings, Skrill documents figurative public statuary surveys their destruction or relocation, and explored, explores the flat, fractured nature of personal and public memory, as well as the contemporary reaction to these historical works. As I mentioned earlier, a selection of his work is currently on view in a virtual exhibition at our museum. And Howard, why don't you uh, get us started with, uh, with your first question? Well, thank you, Carrie. Uh, yes, um, Dr. Sine, um, hello. Um, I, I just, I just wanted to mention I, I, I attended um, three out of the four uh, hearings uh, of the of the commission. Um, it was it was a, a fascinating experience, uh, and I do actually ag agree on the. Uh, duality that you mentioned on the onset about how people reacted. I'm sure you were quite um, almost able to predict that people would either be for um, Columbus staying or against Columbus staying uh, from their particular, uh, their particular um, point of view or ideology. Um, but um, my, my question is, um, is is really specific i mean you the the word that i was um thinking about while you were discussing mount rushmore is i hope i'm pronouncing this right pahasapa um, pahasapa those are the hills the black hills yes they are i mean i when i was a kid i uh i went through the badlands and uh, went into that region. I actually don't recall I actually visited Mount Rushmore uh, <laughs> because it, um, I think when I was younger, it offended my sensibility. 
Um, but um, uh, I was listening to um, Elizabeth Alexander from the um, the Mellon uh, the Mellon Foundation um, in a lecture, which <laughs> Carrie was, uh, pointed me towards, as I was very happy to hear. Uh, and in preparation for our, for our conversation, I um, I re listened to it a second time. Uh, Ms. Alexander said something I thought that that was really, um, I mean, she had very profound insights and questions for uh, her panelists. And one of the questions that she asked, and I think this is really a kind of crucial to this whole question, and I'd love to hear how you feel about it, is how, what do you do with monuments that are, and I'm paraphrasing or quoting her directory, are instructions in non-personhood. Um, the uh, placement of this monument to um, uh, 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 traditional European patriarchy uh, upon hill, within hills which were the source of life for the Lakota nation um, is an imprint of the supremacy of this European worldview over that of the people who occupied this particular region. And, you know, we also have, you know, statues of Jackson who, Andrew Jackson, who is of course responsible for uh, exile and genocide. Um, what do you think we should do when these monuments are so a part of, for instance, turning the Lakota into non-persons? Well, fortunately, I don't think the Lakota have been turned into non-persons. Uh, moving onward from about the 1970s, there have been many more assertions of Native American identity in a more positive light. They have not gone away. It's a tribute to their perseverance and the fact that we hear more and more things being in the news. That does not make any of this right. Um, one of the things I've come to realize from serving on several of these public commissions is that there are certain pragmatic concerns that one has to consider. With Mount Rushmore, it is so embedded now in all kinds of American issues that exclude the Lakota Sioux, of course, that would be very difficult to take it down. I can't imagine the national outcry. But I think what we can do here and what we can do with other problematic um, statues, monuments, is introduce programs that enlarge the conversation. We can do um, artist interventions, the kinds of projections that Christoph Wadishko does to change the conversation. There can be all kinds of programmatic interventions. There can be performances, there can be films. Our history books can be rewritten without removing this. And there can be, um, you know, there can be memorials, although in general, Native Americans are not very fond of memorials, but there can be tributes to Native American identities. When the first Native American superintendent was appointed at Mount Rushmore, he began instituting some of those programs. He started by building a teepee just to make the point that you're raising, Howard, that there was a different presence here. And he started introducing a trail um, along which visitors could go and interact with guides who would explain some of that Native American history to them. But I wanted to also refer back briefly to the hearings that you mentioned. Um, Columbus presented a similar problem to the commission. It was like there were so many references to Columbus. Where would we stop? I mean, a lot of places have already removed his name, but if you think about Columbus Avenue, Columbia University, um, it's not just one thing and it's not about the statues. These controversies are about implicit issues of things that are wrong, things that need addressing. And that's the part of the equation that hasn't quite been built in yet. In other words, when the commission advocated for the removal of Sims, 
We also advocated that there be programs addressing women's health at the New York Academy of Medicine across the street. So I think we need to see pairings instituted that make actual societal change possible. And I'm just gonna end that with that remark with one thing that I love. It was a remark made by a man at the Bronx hearing. I don't know if that was the one, one of the ones you were at, Howard. Did. Mm -hmm. Where he, he just got up and he said, that was then, this is now, what's the problem? We mm -hmm. can't quite get there yet, but it stayed with me. I had a similar remark when I, when I was talking to a fourth grade uh, class at a school in Brooklyn. So I think children and perhaps people not quite as educated as some of us are, get to the heart of the matter very quickly. Hey, Carrie. Um, Howard just briefly touched on the Mellon Foundation's new um, initiative, which um, is the big news today. This week, it just it was announced Monday, I think, um, which pledges two hundred and fifty million dollars to help reimagine um, monuments and memorials in this country to better reflect the nation's diversity. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this program. Do you, do you see any minefields ahead with this? Um, do you have any ideas for projects that you know have been percolating? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, first, I wanna say that one of the things they've already funded um, is this group Monument Lab in Philadelphia that had already done an experimental exhibition a couple of years back, two, three years back, of commissioning local artists to create new forms in sites of their own choosing. I didn't get a chance to see it, but I really admired the concept and the idea of actually doing that. Um, I think that one of the things that they're doing now and that the Mellon is funding is an overall survey of monuments throughout the country. So in other words, they're taking a proactive approach as opposed to the reactive actions we've been taking in response to controversies, which are always political. And then we're not really looking at the fuller picture. If you just look at the four things that we talked about in New York, they have nothing to do with one another. They just happen to be the objects of controversy. So I'm very excited about creating a monument lab, creating this database that will enable us to really answer all kinds of questions about what's up um, in any part of the country at any point in time. And the New York City Task Force, which hasn't met yet, is going to try to do that on a local level. And I think that that's very positive for us to be able to think about this in a larger way. Now, $250 million sounds like a huge amount of money, and it is a huge amount of money, but memorials are expensive. So the minefield that I'm seeing is how far will this go? And what will be the things that they choose to fund? Okay. Uh, Howard, further, we'll go back to you, Howard, go ahead. Yeah, further on to the point that um, bringing up uh, Mellon and, and you are bringing up monuments left, Dr. Sine, um, I was listening yesterday to a uh, Paul Farber uh, director and he, was elated to go to Richmond and see the graffiti tagging of the base of the, of the statue of, Ro of Robert E. Lee. Um, it made him extremely excited. Uh, what do you think about things like that? I think it's vandalism. I think that we should have as serious a process for me removing memorials as we do for putting them up. Um, an analogy that I gave just recently to my class was if we made changes to a written text, we would call it censorship. Why isn't this comparable? I don't, I don't think that vandalism is something to be condoned. I understand that there is an immediate satisfaction in these actions. I understand that people have been prompted by years and years of abuse and mistreatment but I think as a society, we really need to find a better way. Harriet, uh, you're exactly right that the, the um, events of the past uh, four or five months, the public demonstrations, that it's fascinating how monuments, statues, public memorials have become a kind of punching bag 
a kind of foil. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the demonstrations, uh, Black Lives Matter. Let's talk about uh, the, the hundred, really hundreds of thousands of men and women across the United States. And as you said, for example, in Portland, the, a statue of George Washington was, uh, I think, decapitated, the head was cut off. Here in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and in Norwalk, Connecticut, uh, mm -hmm. statues, very, very beloved statues of the Italian-American community of Christopher Columbus were removed from uh, Seaside Park in Bridgeport. Uh, and, and so the statues have become a lightning rod, a kind of part of the uproar uh, about whether these are demonstrations or as you said appropriately, uh, there's, no, there's no tolerance for vandalism. Uh, I'm gonna ask a, 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 more diff a, a question about what happens, uh, here's when you have a monument that's so clearly, I'm gonna to read to you from, this, is a, this was during in July when a lot was going on about memorials and the wall, I, I purposely went to a, a, one of the editorial, the art writer for the Wall Street Journal who the journal has been very much about, you know, these are symbols of America and they, and Eric Gibson, the art writer says, if any ma monument ever deserved bulldozing into oblivion, it, would, it was Auschwitz, uh, which was synonymous with every evil of the final solution. The point that he's making is that a decision was made not to bulldoze Auschwitz, this horrible place and rather than Let's, re let's remove it, let's cancel it. But then in a strange way, it has become the solemn memorial to its victims, that it is almost singular in its representation of the Holocaust. And so I, I wonder if we from 30,000 feet could say, while our passion of the moment and this summer was so filled with the removal of monuments, maybe 10, 20 years from now, some of these awful Im images and symbols of racism and of American uh, expansionism, maybe they need to be left in place, maybe for the next generation. I think that that's a really interesting point. I mean, I would certainly in general agree. First of all, I'd like to make the point that has been made by Kirk Savage that monuments provide a forum for discussion. I mean, that's totally what's happening at Auschwitz. And I think Auschwitz is an interesting example because it's so writ large, this practice of making memorials to victims rather than heroes. And for example, the director of the 9-11 Museum came from the Holocaust Museum in DC so that whole movement to sort of commemorate victims, which we did in Oklahoma City and Columbine as well, has somehow taken over what had been a previous practice of commemorating whom we call heroes. I think this notion that memorials are forums is important and we don't want to remove our forums for discussion. But there's another suggestion that's been made which is kind of interesting to me too, although I don't know whether I think it's a good idea, but let me share it anyway. And that is that we leave the base of the memorials. So when the, um, well, I'll give you two examples of it. When the, move, the, when the decision that the Museum of Natural History made to remove the Roosevelt statue, Gonzalo Casals, who's the Director of Cultural Affairs for New York, one of his suggestions was to leave the base and create something like the fourth plinth sculpture in London with changing exhibitions, which would present the opportunity for different conversations at different points in time. The commission in New York made the decision to, to leave the base of the Sims for a while, but we made that decision in a hurry and some of us changed our minds afterwards. And in any event, some new work will be built there. But I put it out there as one suggestion of somewhat removing the content which seems so objectionable now and leaving some reminder of what was once there. Carrie? Uh, I, I just, I could have this conversation all night long. It's, there's <laughs> so, so much to talk about. Um, 
I, I was reading an interview, Harriet, that um, you gave uh, quite a few years ago. Um, and I know you have your background before art history was in technology a little bit. So you suggested that in the future, um, maybe apps would should be developed to um, let people know about the public art in their midst, like that they might not even be seeing because it's something they walk by every day or something that they don't understand why it's objectionable. Um, I, I mean, I think that's a great idea. I'm just wondering if since then you've had other thoughts along those lines in terms of, you know, using technology to recontextualize some of these um, really problematic sculptures, but also just to um, to to create knowledge to, to share with with the public. Um, I think that that is going on in certain, you know, in several places now, just in a general way, you know, here's the public art in our city when you get to this set or the other thing. What I don't know and what I don't think anybody has come up with a satisfactory suggestion is what form should this take? I don't know whether anybody here remembers QR codes. They were very popular for a while, but they didn't somehow catch on. I thought that wasn't a bad idea. Um, because most people have a phone, you could do it, you could, you know, look something up. But what form that should take, how we should access it from the street. And, and the point is, well, of course, I'm coming from New York, so that's a different experience. But most people don't stop to look at anything, except where they're going. Um, I, I once, I do an assignment called Memorial Watch, where I have students just engage with a work of public art for the course of the semester and see what goes on there. And one very clever student a number of years back said, well, this statue was not looked at a thousand times. She had watched a thousand people walk past. They're not looking at the statue. And that was before phones. Now with phones, What's the link between the work and the phone? If somebody could figure that out, we might have an answer. But I, I do think that people are curious. You know, when my students engage them in conversations, they want to know more. Even when there's a plaque next to the work that tells them exactly what the student is telling them. I, I'm just reporting back. I don't know why that is. Okay. Um, Harry, can I ask? I'm go sorry. ahead, Howard, go can ahead. I just Howard. One, one more question. Um, sure. It's about passion, um, Dr. Sine. Um, when when the uh, Saddam statue was uh, pulled down in in Baghdad, mm -hmm. it caused the people of Baghdad to feel elation that they were liberated from their oppressor. Um, is there a place for that kind of spontaneous um, form of outpouring uh, in opposition to monuments? Or do you think that it must always be mediated by um, institutional forces? I wouldn't necessarily call them institutional forces. And I think that kind of passion, like lots of kinds of passion are fleeting. The satisfaction is in the moment and it feels great and people feel great, but in the end, what has changed? So I'll give an example recently, and I guess you could say it was an institutional um, intervention. I heard a very civil and civic minded debate about what should happen to the copy of the emancipation statue in Washington, D.C. that depicts a standing Lincoln and a kneeling slave who was a specific person um, breaking free of his chains, but he is also semi nude. And there were a lot of objections to this particular monument in Washington where the original is and in Boston. And the art commission held a public hearing and there were various opinions voiced, including um, a descendant of the man who was depicted as the slave. It was all done in a very civic and civilized way. The art commission then decided to have it removed to put signage there, et cetera. And I have to say, I was really encouraged that that kind of thing is possible. Now, whether that's possible all over the world, I have no idea, but it would be my first choice of a way to go because everybody had a chance to be heard. Thank you. Okay, Harriet, uh, we have some questions and uh, these are uh, from some students and members of the community. Uh, student, uh, Mr. Nicholas Gale asked if we need to show the next generation our statues, 
about history via history. Why do the statues of African peoples get locked up in the Natural History Museum? Why don't we put it out for everyone to see? Well, there is, there is a movement I know in New York and elsewhere to expand the kinds of memorials that we build and those will be built in public places. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what works you're referring to if they're depictions of generic African Americans or specific African Americans, but there is a move to expand the vocabulary of our memo uh, memorial sculptures that I hope really takes root. Okay. Uh, Mr. Andrew Melville asked, do you feel people are more lenient towards memorials and statues that are abstract versus those that are a physical representation of an individual? Depends on the individual. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, if you think about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which is abstract, um, although it was controversial at first, it's become one of the most popular um, works on the National Mall. People interact with it all the time, leaving things there, et cetera. Um, that's highly popular. The Lincoln Memorial is figural and that's highly popular. So I'm not sure that you can necessarily make that distinction. I think it depends on the memorial and how successful it is in terms of engaging a public. Isabella Quink asked, should we eradicate monuments that show our history because of its negative connotations or should we allow history to be shown? I wish I knew what specific history was being referred to here. Yeah. Um, if it's Confederate, if it's memorials but, celebrating the Confederacy, I think those should go um, because those are not the values of this country, just the opposite, I would hope, at least for most of us. Mm -hmm. um, the question that we haven't tackled and for which I also don't have an answer is what should we do with them? Um, for example, Sims is now in storage. Dr. Sims that we removed um, in Manhattan uh, is in storage at Greenwood Cemetery because they turned out they didn't want him there either and he was too big to fit on Dr. Sims' grave. Um, I suggested one time somewhat ironically that we should have a museum for rejected monuments. And some people kind of took that seriously and I didn't really mean it. I don't have an answer. Nobody so far has come up with an answer, but we keep asking the same question. Yeah, but Harriet, um, it seems as though the Metropolitan Museum of Art is the Museum of Rejected Monuments. Not entirely. <laughs> okay, and Chris Peliota asked, do you think that the media, the news, plays a large role in influencing the eradication of monuments across the United States? How do you see the the media participating in this movement about taking down monuments? I think that's a really good question. I think the media thrives on controversy and they feed controversy and not just about monuments. That's what makes a story. Controversy makes a story. Everything working out all right seems to be a little bit boring or they think it's a little bit boring to people. And I think it definitely I don't know whether it feeds the eradication, it probably does, but what it definitely does, it's divisive and it foments more controversy. Okay. Well, we are really just about out of time. Uh, I want to again, thank uh, Howard Skrill for always for your contributions to our campus life uh, in art and being part of this conversation. Of course, uh, to Carrie Weaver and our friends at the Fairfield University Art Museum. Uh, before I sign off with uh, Dr. Sini, let me uh, let me go back to a, you made a great statement in your in your presentation when you said we need a more nuanced conversation, and this is uh, in complete agreement with you is Professor Douglas Brinkley, the great presidential historian at Rice University, when those types of complexities. Douglas, Professor Brinkley wrote, I think it's better to try 
to teach about how complicated history really is. And I think you, Harriet, tonight you've really given us uh, the long and short of that history. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience uh, that next Wednesday night, we're going to be joined by Jared Cohn. Uh, Jared is the CEO of Google's think tank called Jigsaw. And appropriate to presidential history, his new book, which I, I think I have here, his new book is called uh, Accidental Presidents. It's a fascinating book about how eight men rose to the presidency by accident or by death or assassination, even more relevant from the events of last weekend, obviously having the president himself uh, under medical supervision at Walter Reed. So we invite you back next Wednesday night at eight o'clock for Open Visions with Jared Cohn. Uh, we wanna thank you from the Quick Center for the Arts, uh, Fairfield University, Fairfield University Art Museum. We wish you all the best, be well, be safe and good luck. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>